This week, Renee and I, on Tuesday, we celebrated our 36th wedding anniversary, right? So, now, here's the deal. If you're new here today, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. But I'll let you know this. 36 years with this group is not a big deal because there are people in this crowd, they have been married 45, 50, 55 years, right? Now, we've got some people in this place, man, that are newlyweds, right? we got newlyweds who are here in this place. I'll say this just real quick. Those that are newlyweds in this place, I hope you will gain wisdom from those who've been married for these 45 and 50 years, all right? Now, anytime Renee and I take a, a new couple out to eat, We'll go out to eat with them, and we will always ask the story, uh, of ask their story. How did you guys meet? How did you guys get married? Fill, fill us in on y'all's story. Renee and I, we, we met in college. We both uh, attended over in San Marcos, and we are both college students over there. And uh, Renee dated my best friend for three years. She was very patient. She knew what she was doing, very strategic, all right? <laughs> She's like, this guy's a pawn. I'm getting to the king, right? So, just saying. And uh, send all emails to Josh Seisma. Okay, so that's, that's actually how Renee and I met. Seriously, we're college together. But today, we're going to share a really interesting meet and greet marriage story. Now, in this room, there are married couples that are in here. I know there's some fantastic stories. There are people who you met because a friend introduced you, or maybe it was a neighbor who was in, uh, down the street and y'all met, or maybe it was somebody that you met online. But I guarantee today the story that we're going to share about Isaac and Rebecca is so unique. And so I'm going to ask you guys, if you would, first off, man, take out your Bibles. You guys got your Bibles with you this morning? Hold those up if you got them. Hold them up. Love it, love it, love it. Turn over. We're going to be in that very first book, that book of Genesis, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 24, in Genesis chapter 24. Now, those of y'all, again, first time here, again, welcome. Those are joining us online. So glad to have you guys with us as well. This summer... We've been going through a series called Origins, and that is we've been going through the stories of the book of Genesis, whether it be in here or even our kiddos in Kid Zone, they're going through the exact same stories that we're teaching in here. Today, they're teaching about uh, Isaac and Rebecca. Now, the story of Isaac and Rebecca, I want to say this real quick. If you are single in this room, single online, I'm telling you, this message is for you. Because it talks about a supernatural meet and greet marriage that takes place. But let me hit this also. If you're sitting here today saying, Scott, I, we're part of those couples that have been married, you know, 25, 35, 45 years. I promise you this message has principles for you as well. Because I would tell you this, in a society right now that is trying to confuse what it means about marriage, what marriage was intended to be, created by God. Can I say this? Marriage, that was God's idea. That was the originator. That was the creator. That was God's idea. And so to be able to, if we're going to sit here and try to figure it out ourselves, or we look at the creator of something and say, you tell us, What's the game plan here? How does this work out? So you may be sitting here today saying, Scott, I got kids that I need to forward this message on to. I'm sitting here with grandkids. They need to hear this. But I promise you, for every single one of us in this room, there are principles in here that we need to look at. Men, can I say it to us? We as men, we need to look at the principles that are here because you and I, we continue to grow. You got a pulse, you got a purpose. We're not done growing. Ladies inside of this room, I promise you to be able to hear the principles of what God says about marriage and say, am I growing in this area? Am I living in that? Am I living up to it? So today we look at this incredible story, this story that we see. And what we've got is, in our origin series, we went through creation, Adam and Eve. We talked about Noah. We went to the Tower of Babel. Then we started diving into this man's life called Abraham. 
And with Abraham in his old age, God came and made him a promise that I'm going to give you, I'm going to bless you. In fact, Abraham, you're going to be my guy that I work through. Man, what a blessing. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to give you more descendants than there are stars in the sky, grains of sand on the beach. The problem was Abraham and his wife Sarah were old in age, and they had no kids. But yet God still made a promise, because what's impossible with men is not impossible with God. Amen? So we go from Abraham receiving this promise. Abraham then receives the promise fulfilled. His name was Isaac. So we have Abraham, we have Isaac. The name Isaac means laughter. We see Abraham even taking the promise that God gave him, what he was waiting for, what he was longing for, what he desired, he still took that and offered it to God and said, God, if this is not of you, take it. If it is of you, bless it. And we spoke on Father's Day to all the men, and we said this, gentlemen, Being a man, being a man, part of it is sacrifice. Men, world does not revolve around us. We hold up the world. We are the ones that we make choices, not based on our desires, but choices on what is best, what is right. Which means there will be times in our life that we will sacrifice. Well, Abraham did exactly that. Now we got to the point. Now we get to the point where we are in our our story account today in chapter 24 where Isaac is now a young man and he's ready to be married. Here's the crazy thing. He says, Dad, find me a wife. No, don't go getting spiritual on me. How many of y'all in this room would say that to your dad? (laughs) Dad, go find my wife. I heard this story one time, young man, college age, every time he brought a date home to meet his family, his mom hated her. Mom always found something wrong with her. She's too tall. She's too loud. I don't like her view. She can't cut. Do you see the color of her hair? Never liked anything about any of the girls this young man brought home. So the guy finally decided, I'm going to get one over on mom. He found a girl exactly like his mom. She looked like mom. She cooked like mom. She talked. It, it was like looking in a mirror. You saw his mom. He brought that girl home. Mom loved her. Just loved her. Dad hated her. <laughs> Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24 says this, Abraham was now very old in age, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. Stop right there. Abraham was very old in age. Now listen, it's bizarre that the older I get, the idea of old age keeps getting further and further away. So I'm not going to sit here today and ever say of any of our people in this room, yeah, he's up there. He's, He's getting old. Listen, Abraham at this point, at this point in the story, is between 137 to 140 years old. Y'all with me? So when you hit 140, I will be able to say, yeah, he's getting old, all right? But until then, you're safe. But the scripture also goes on and it says this. It says in verse 2, he said to a senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land we're now living, but will go to the country of my own relatives and will get a wife for my son Isaac. Now, first off, let let, let me hit this. There's some beautiful stuff I I don't want us to miss in this this story. So this last week, I know... um, Brent and Jane Lyon, man, elders here in our church, man, they just had another grandbaby, had a grandson. Crenshaw's, we got the very first grandson in, in our household, right? And uh, dude's a bruiser, right? He's 8'4", 22 inches long, uh, came out, slapped the nurse. I mean, he's, he's a beast. Um, but already with my grandkids, a little three-year-old girl, a little 17, 18-month-old girl, I want to start telling the stories. See, I don't, I don't want my grandkids to not hear the stories and as they get older to learn the principles that are inside of the Word of God. The stories are important 
to tell. And inside of these stories for us, see, the, the kids, I'm sure they're drawing little pictures of, you know, Isaac meeting Rebecca and all these things. We're not going to be doing coloring today, all right? No flannel graphs, sorry. But instead, what I want to be able to do for us as adults, I want to be able to take us to the principles. And can I tell you something? In this one chapter, there are so many godly principles that God has in store for us. First off, let, 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 me, let me just hit this, this one simple one, and it would be this. We read it. It says, the Lord blessed him, talking about Abraham, blessed him in every way. Now, first, I want you, if you're taking notes, man, jot this down. He knew that he was blessed. He knew that he was blessed. Let me encourage you with this word. You are not going to be able to have anxiety and curse and frustration come in out of the same mouth that speaks about the blessings. When you have an attitude of gratitude, can I tell you something? It will start to combat depression. When you start acknowledging that you are blessed in the midst of, well, I don't have this, I don't have this, and they have this over there, and I don't have that, and man, I wish that I would have. No, if you start changing that mentality, to start acknowledging the blessings that you do have. Because, can I go ahead and say this to you right now? You are blessed. You are blessed. So it is one thing to be able to say, I acknowledge the blessing. But then it's another thing to be able to say, I know where it comes from. No, no, stay with me, because some of y'all... We can speak about blessing. The world out there, the world apart from Jesus can talk about, well, how are you? Dude, I'm good. I'm good. I'm blessed. I've been working hard at work, and it's paying off, and, and you know, we've been invested in this. And, well, you might as well be in Vegas, okay? No, no. Where does that blessing come from? Do you acknowledge? It's one thing to say, I'm blessed. It's another thing to say, I know where those blessings come from. The scripture says in the book of James that every good and faithful gift comes down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. So one, can you speak that you know you're blessed? Two, can you acknowledge where those blessings come from? It's from the hand of God. It is from the hand of God. Scripture goes on and it's going to say this. It says that Abraham, he asked his servant, will you go and find a bride for my son? That's not a little request, is it? This is, this is the grandfather. He knows God's given him a promise. He knows someday there's going to be a lot of grandkids going on, but he's looking at a servant going, dude, I want you to go find her. In other words, this is the point that I want you to see. He had trustworthy people around him. Now, you're single in this room today. You're single and you're watching this online. Here's my question to you. Do you have trustworthy people around you? Now, why is that important? Well, because they'll see things that you don't. I, I, I call it scorpions on the back. If I've got a scorpion on my back and, and I don't see it, I don't feel it, I may not know that it's there. But if I've got trustworthy people around me, they can say, Scott, we got a problem. Here's my question to you. Do you have people in your life that can call you out? Do you have people in your life that if they see a character flaw, if they see something going on in your life that's not right, do you have people that can call that out? And you may sit here today and go, well, Scott, that didn't sound fun. Well, the scripture tells us, man, it says bruises from a friend can be trusted. Well, you hear that today. Bruises from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Bruises from a friend can be trusted. Now, it's one thing. I'll just go ahead and tell you this. It's one thing to have trustworthy people in your life that can call things out. When I talk to the single people and I'm talking to you and you're sitting here and you're in the haunt for that person, you can have this guy, this girl in your life and you're going, oh, this is them. They are, I mean, and, and you can be blinded. I'm going to use a Disney phrase here. You're Twitter-pated. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Your brother over here got it. Rest of y'all look it up. All right. You are, you are starstruck. You've got the, oh, this is them. This is the one. You need to make sure you got trustworthy people in your life to be able to say, dude, I'm seeing red flags left and right. Do you have trustworthy people in your life to call those things out? But then here's the second one. One is, do you have trustworthy people? Second is this, are you teachable? Because see, some of you in this room, you got people who love you. And they'll call some things out. But are you teachable enough to receive it? That's a phrase. Can, can I speak this to, to, to newlyweds? That's a phrase me and Renee use in our conversation, when she needs to, because Renee's one of my trustworthy people, huge, trustworthy, my number one trustworthy per person. But she comes to me and she will ask me this question before she brings that to me. She'll ask this question, are you teachable? She'll ask me that question, because can I just go and open up the chest cavity and be honest? There are times I'm not. Can I just go and shoot straight with you? But you're a pastor, you have to. No, I'm human, so I don't, Okay. So Renee comes to me, she'll ask me that question, are you teachable? We got to make sure, one, that you got trustworthy people. Listen, if you are looking for that spouse, you're looking for the right person to date, or maybe you're looking for the right people to enter into business agreements with, the people that are trustworthy in your life, you need to listen to them. But you also need to be teachable to them. Because what good is it to have uh, trustworthy people if you're not teachable? Real quick, real quick. Remember when David fell sexually with Bathsheba. King David, right? Man after God's own heart. Had this affair with this woman, married woman named Bathsheba. Well, first off, you, you need to see this in the story. We, we read about it in 1 Samuel. but I, I'm sorry, in 2 Samuel. But in the story, what you got happening is you got King David. And the scripture says, while kings were off at war, King David wasn't. So in other words, he wasn't where he needed to be. Whole nother message. He's up in the tower, and he looks down. He's the king, so he's got the tallest tower, tallest building, right? He looks down, and sees this beautiful woman. She's on top of the roof. She's bathing. Her name's Bathsheba. King David comes inside, and he calls. Who does he call? Those trustworthy guys. Praise God. He had trustworthy men in his life. And he asked them the question. He goes, hey, guys, um, down here, second block, third house from the left, uh, saw this woman down there bathing. Uh, anybody know who that is? Now see, because those trusted men, they, they knew David. You want people that actually know you. Because those men, they saw the wheels turning in David's mind. They knew David well enough to know lust is kicking in here. It's King David, man after God's own heart. Yeah, and lust is kicking in. They knew him well enough. That when they asked, when David asked, who is that woman? You know what they tried to do? They were trying to slap David by, bring, by, by waking him up, but at the same time honoring the king. See, they were honoring his position as king, but they wanted to wake their brother up. And so what, they, what did they say to him? They said, um, King David, that's, um, isn't that somebody's daughter? Hey, David, uh, king, is, isn't that... Uriah the Hittite's wife. He had trustworthy men. They're trying to wake him up. David, snap out of it, bro. You're not on a good path. David had trustworthy men. But in that moment, David was not teachable. My encouragement to you is that in whatever we do, do we have trustworthy people in your life? Do you have trustworthy people? I speak this to men because so many times we as men, we just, we try to white knuckle it and just do life by ourselves. And we need real people in our life. We weren't created to be an island. Let me give you one last thing just real quick here even in this intro. Who is this servant? You got Abraham looking at a servant saying, dude, go get a wife for my boy. Who is this servant? Well, 
if you're looking at the text, we're actually not given the name, but, but I'm going to give you my opinion here. I believe that it's this man named Eleazar. We read about Eleazar earlier. He is the high trusted servant. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, I, I believe it's Eleazar. Eleazar, go find a wife for my boy. The name Eleazar is an incredible word. You know what it means? God's helper. You know what Eleazar means? Comforter. Was, was there another time when Jesus called somebody by those names? Was there a time when Jesus said, hey, listen, guys, I, I got to go to heaven, but when I do, I, I need to go there so that I can send to you the helper, so that I can send to you the comforter. So many times, things that we see physical in the Old Testament are spiritual in the New. And I'm just going to go ahead and say this. Eleazar is a picture of the Holy Spirit. So what we see is, we see somebody saying, hey, comforter, hey, helper of God, I need you to go find this bride. I need you to go find this husband. I so encourage single people in this room, listen, you've given your life to God. Give them your marriage. Start off by saying, God, you pick them out. So many times I know I've, I've met people who are like, Scott, I have found the one. I mean, really? Have you taken them to God? Because God may say, be afraid. Be very afraid. You got any, just real quick, just a thought. You got any idea what that person's going to be like in 30 years? Because God does. And God may be going, run. Give you one last picture and we're, we're done. <laughs> we're not done. There is so much to this, to this whole chapter. But, it, but, it, but I got to hit this one. Verse 4, look at verse 4. It says this. Go to my country and my own relatives and get a son for my, or get a wife for my son Isaac. Go to my country. Go to my relatives. Go to my relatives and find a wife. Okay, those of y'all from Mississippi, don't get confused on this passage. <laughs> Here's what he's saying. Remember what I just said earlier? So many things that are physical in the Old Testament are spiritual in the New. What is Abraham saying? Go find somebody inside of the family of God. Go find a believer. Go find somebody that's a part of this family. Single people, listen to this passage. You want this passage. You want this passage. 1 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness and lawlessness... And what communion is there with light and darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? That's the devil. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Verse 16. And what agreement is the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 17, therefore come out from among them and be separate. That word separate, you know what that is? That's the word holy. Some of us got this idea, well, to be holy means you stop cussing. No, to be holy means you are separated. You've been set apart. And be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Have you ever played tug of war? You ever played tug of war? Whew, you know what that is? That's just a challenge. That's an ongoing fight. And that's why the Word of God says this, don't be unequally yoked. 
The idea of unequally yoked is you got two oxen. This is, when this was written, it was before John Deere. And so what you got is you got oxen. And you would have two of these big old beefy bulls up there. And you would yoke them together with this, this wood that would go between their necks, and they would plow the field. Now here's what you don't want. You don't want a weak ox with a powerful, strong ox. Why? Because that's going to pull you off course. And that's why the Word of God says this, don't be unequally yoked. The kingdom of God says it's straight and narrow. Few find it. And what you don't want to do is enter into a relationship to where you've got a divided house. You don't want one person saying, we want to follow God, we want to raise our children, understanding the things of God. We want to raise our children in church and then to have a spouse go, eh, we'll figure it out. You don't want to have somebody saying, hey, we want to set up our marriage like God talks about. We want to do our finances the way God says to. I want to build our relationship, our, our future together. I want to build it on a rock. And then your spouse goes, you know, why not let's just build it on the sand? House divided is not going to stand. And that's why Abraham said, go and find somebody from the family. And when the servant goes, he prays, God, this is quite the undertaking. Give me favor. And he goes to and he finds this young girl named Rebecca. And where does he find this woman? At the well. Single people, can I tell you this? Find people that know how to drink from the well. Amen. Find, peop find people who know not only to go to the well. Listen, listen. But find those people that know how to drink from the well themselves. Because I've seen way too many people enter into, tell me if I'm missing this, I see people who enter into these relationships. You got a guy and he grabs hold of this girl and he's trying to find his identity in her. He's trying to find his security in her. And he's just sucking off this girl, just trying to get identity and security from this relationship. And then what happens with the girl? She's doing the same thing. She's trying to find, oh, well, I'm, I'm looking for this guy who's going to complete me. I, I, need, I saw Disney movies, and so where's my prince? And so she finds this guy, and she's sucking identity off him and security off him. She's sucking, hey, he's sucking, what do you got? Hey, let me give you a picture. Two ticks, no dog. <laughs> Where do you want to look for a girl? Find her at the well. Where do you want to find a husband? Go to the well. And find somebody that knows how to drink themselves. Rebecca would be the girl that Eliezer, I believe, would bring home. And Abraham, his last word to Eliezer before he took off was this. If you go there and you find this girl... She doesn't want to come back. Don't make her. <laughs> Thought it was kind of crazy. Don't knock her out and drag her home and go, look what I got. <laughs> Here's the truth. Here's the simple truth in this. Don't make it happen. Can I say that to single people? Parents, can I say that to us, that we would teach that truth to our kids? Don't have your sons and daughters become people that they're not to try to attract people that they don't need to be with. I've watched girls who had standards, godly standards, and they looked around. They didn't see anybody to meet the standard. So they lowered the standard. Still nothing. So finally, the standard they lowered met, the, met exactly who somebody was in the crowd. Don't make it happen. Gentlemen, play the man. 
Don't, don't become some wuss to try to get this girl. Be the man that God has called you to be. Because the man that God has called you to be has got that woman that is looking for that man that God has called you to be.